Boxing with the Archon, I'm Mark Boo, and just want to share with you guys today, we got a box in from Forge World. I was going to share with you guys the uh, new rules for some of the models, uh, take a look at how things translated into 8th edition, as well as take a look at uh, the, mold, the models themselves, the molds, uh, see what kind of work you're getting yourself into when working with uh, these resin kits. So if you're going to spend this kind of money on these kind of products, you want to make sure that you're going to have a good time putting it together. Um, so let's take a look here. Uh, first off, the box itself actually from coming from England uh, seems to be in pretty good shape, didn't get beat, uh, beat up too much in the transit. Um, there was some packing material in here that I did remove uh, due to wanting to make sure everything was uh, had arrived. Um, first thing I'm going to pull out here are the indexes. Um, we got the Xeno Superior Armor Index as well as the Astra Militarum Index. Um, as you can see, the Xenos one does cover all the Xenos races. Uh, there's not a Xenos 1 or 2 like there is for uh, 40k. Uh, everything is in one book. Um, and the Astra Militarum, they get their own book, which is actually even thicker than the Xenos one. So uh, Astra Militarum has even more stuff than all the alien races combined. But when you think about how big it is, um, that's pretty understandable. So the first model we're going to take a look at here, um, the Cyclops Demolition Vehicle actually picked up three of those because you can actually run them in a squadron of three. Um, so some of these popped off uh, the molds, but this one here didn't. Uh, we've got just one, uh, one injection mold, three parts. Um, so it's actually a pretty simple and easy model to put together. You just got two sections of tread um, and the main body of the vehicle itself. Um, Taking a closer look at things, uh, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of extra flashing or anything like that on here. So it should be pretty easy to uh, take apart, uh, get off the screw, clean up, and put together. We'll take a look at what the demolition vehicle does. Uh, the indexes are pretty easily laid out. Um, Cyclops demolition vehicle is on page 15. All right, so you can see that the indexes for Imperial Armor are laid out uh, quite a lot like the regular GW ones. Uh, it's just a big stat sheet for everything here. Um, so <clears throat> take a closer look at this here. Cyclops Demolition Vehicle has a power level of three. It's a heavy slot, uh, movement of 10 inches, weapon and ballistic skill. Uh, weapon is six plus, ballistics is four plus. Uh, strength is four, toughness is six. Uh, it has four, uh, four wounds on it, one attack, a leadership of seven and a three plus armor save. Uh, you can, like I said before, take up to two additional demolition vehicles uh, whenever you buy one of these units, so you can have three of these guys running around. Um, they don't have any weapons on them except for the Cyclops demolition charge. Um, so it's a special range. The type is a heavy 2d6 with a strength of nine, AP is minus two, and doing d3 damage per hit. Um, and this weapon automatically hits the target, but can only be used once a battle. Now that may seem like uh, a bit crazy, but these things are basically just remote control bombs. Um, the Cyclops Demolition Charge Special Rules, at the start of any of the small shooting phases, so long as it didn't advance, and with a 10 inch movement, you can probably get pretty close to guys by turn two or three. Um, you can choose to detonate the Cyclops Demolition Charge, when it does, every unit, both friendly and enemy, so you gotta be a little careful with this, within D6 inches is automatically hit by the weapon using the profile above. Roll separately for each unit. Once this model is detonated, Cyclops Demolition Charge, remove it from play. Any Cyclops Demolition Vehicle that is removed from play in this way does not award victory points in scenarios that offer victory points for slaying enemy models. So, if somebody shoots it and it blows up, or they kill it, they get the victory point, but if you're the one who actually hits the button and blows this thing up, you don't award victory points for destroying models to your opponent, which is a good thing. Um, and this is a vehicle 
so it does have a chance to explode. If this model is reduced to zero wounds, and remember it has four, roll a d6 before removing it from the battlefield. On a three plus, which is pretty high, but then again, this thing is just a giant remote control bomb, it explodes and every unit within six inches suffers d3 mortal wounds. So again, this thing packs a big punch, and as we've seen, taking a look at it, it's actually quite small. So you're gonna be able to hide this thing in terrain, run it around hills, keep it out of line of sight until you're ready to drive it up into your enemy's lines and take a big chunk out of it. Um, and these things are set up as vehicle squadrons, so all the models in the unit must be placed within six inches of each other, but from that point on, they operate independently. So you can have these guys spaced out on your line at the start and then have them drive in different directions or you can have them all kind of run together. Um, but they're actually, for three power points, uh, they're pretty impressive with what they can accomplish if you can get them to your enemy's lines. What I'm going to pull out here, <clears throat> take a look at this. Uh, this is the Predator Armored Assault Launcher. So this bad boy has already been causing a lot of commotion at my local shop. Um, as you can see this bag here, um, it's pretty packed full of stuff. Uh, this is quite a large looking model. We'll open the, uh, the bag here. So this looks to be either like the front or the back of it. And it is pretty solid resin. Um, you know, it's pretty thick here. It's got a little extra flashing down here that'll be trimmed off. Um, but the injection points for the mold, these are very thick. Um, so probably going to need to use uh, some kind of saw, a uh, hobby saw to get those off, and then a decent amount of cleanup work. Um, let's see if I can find let's see, a little bag with all the missile heads, uh, some of the accessories, um, looks like the cabins in there. To give you a better idea of the scope of this thing, though, I'm going to try to find one of the tread sections here. And so this is the, the treads that go on there, and again, this is one solid piece of resin. So altogether, this thing's probably going to be pretty heavy. Um, taking a look at this, you can see where it kind of broke off the mold here. Um, and it looks like there's a couple things here that have broken off the injection and transit. So I don't see any broken pieces, um, but because these things broke off, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of extra cleanup or uh, fine detail work that can uh, hinder putting this together a bit. Um, but all in all, again, really solid model. The parts for it, again, these are, this is the uh, missile launcher bay itself. Missiles attach right up here. Um, this is one giant chunk of resin. So this is going to be pretty big thing to put together. Um, transporting it's probably going to be a bit of a pain. Um, but we'll see when it all comes together, um, how that unfolds. We'll wrap this back up real quick. Which I do find it kind of weird that they wrap up the treads and not anything else. But maybe once I get into it, I'll understand why. Um, we'll take a look here at the rules for this thing. And the reason why I got this and the reason it's causing kind of a disturbance in the force of the shop is um, this thing pretty much, it has three missile modes. It has a missile for everything. So it's got something that does a ton of wounds per hit. It does some, it has one that I believe ignores cover. And it has another anti-air missile. So this thing basically has, you know, whatever you need it to do, it has a missile to do it. And let me find where this is here. Creator Army, or, Creator Armored Assault Launcher, it's page 43. So, <clears throat> this thing on its own, it is a Lord of War, so we're not going to be able to use this all the time. However, if you're playing a game against, you know, somebody who has a couple Imperial Knights or a whole Knight Army, uh, like the guy behind the camera over there, hmm. uh, this thing is going to come in very handy. Um, and with the ability to take more Lords of War, Something like this actually will be quite useful. It's not something that you would want to use all the time because just looking at the power level, this thing is 19 power level points. So it is kind of costly whenever you're playing, even if you're 
So that's a pretty hefty investment. Uh, the movement for this thing, well, we'll start off with it, it has 20 wounds. So it is pretty, uh, pretty durable with a three plus armor save. But uh, movement, if we're looking at the chart here, let me just bring this up for the camera. Um, it starts degrading after it loses half of its wounds. So again, starting at 20 wounds, um, this thing's going to be rocking out for quite a while unless it gets focus fired. Which, let's be honest, in a game where you bring this to deal with other Lords of War or heavy uh, equipment, this thing is going to be focus fired. It's probably going to be focus fired simply because it's a Forge World model. Um, but it has a 10 inch movement, a ballistics of 4 plus, and 3 attacks in close combat when it is 10 or above wounds. Uh, 5 to 9 wounds, the movement drops down to 7 with a ballistics of 5 and a d3 of attacks. And then when it's on its last legs, 1 to 4 wounds, it has a 4 inch movement, a ballistics skill of 6, and 1 attack. So you got to remember that it is guard that's driving this thing. Uh, so even though it may have some pretty awesome attacks, you're at best going to be hitting with half of them. So, taking a look at uh, its other stats, its strength and toughness are both 8, uh, so it's pretty durable in that regard. 3-plus um, armor save. It also comes with, on top of the missile launcher, it also has two heavy bolters, but those can be swapped out. Um, the heavy bolters can be... Swap with a combination of either heavy flamers, auto cannons, or last cannons. It can take hunter killer missiles, and it can take a storm bolter or heavy bolter on top. But the big thing here is the Predator launcher. Um, when you're attacking with it, you choose one of the three profiles. So we have the faux hammer pro profile, which is 12 to 120 inches. Uh, the type is heavy 2d6 with a strength 8. AP is minus 2 and does a d6 of damage. So that's your Lord of War, that's your Titan Killer. Um, if you fire that thing at infantry, I really don't know why you did that. Um, then it has the Firestorm missiles, which again range 12 to 120 with uh, heavy 2d6 shots. Strength of 6, AP is again minus 2, does 2 damage, uh, but units attacked by the weapon don't gain any bonus to their, cover for, to their armor for being in cover. So if you've got a unit of uh, guys that are entrenched, like say you even have a team of snipers that are picking off your characters, you can fire this into that uh, cover that they're using. They won't get that bonus. You can kind of root people out of wherever they're hiding. Uh, but then you have the pillow missiles, which these are your anti-air. They have 72 inch range. They only fire a heavy D6, so you get fewer shots, but they are strength eight, which I believe is higher than most anti-air missiles. AP is also minus two, doing a d6 of damage, and it adds one to all hit rolls when attacking models with fly. So again, anti-air. Uh, this thing's pretty massive. Um, what you do have to keep in mind is it is guard that's firing it, so you got a mediocre ballistic skill. The number of shots that you get is highly randomized, um, and even though they hit hard, you know, I could have a bad roll and get maybe four shots off of the firestorm missile. Then because it's guard, I only hit with two of them. So, I mean, it can be devastating if you roll well, but it's a bit of a mixed bag um, as far as reliability is concerned. Uh, so. <clears throat> Next model that we're going to pull out of the box here. This is one of the Dark Eldar. This is the Reaper. So the Reaper is just a modified raider. Um, and you can actually see in here that it has the two plastic sprues for the Raider kit. We'll just open this up. This is a much bigger bag than the uh, assault launcher was in, which I kind of don't understand. Um, so you just got the two plastic sprues that create the Raider. Um, but then also in this bag, you get all the resin conversion pits. So in here you see it has a much larger sail on it. And it's got a couple different blade veins that go on there, as well as um, this piece in here, which I believe this goes along the deck. Um, it actually has the port on it there for where the sail goes. Uh, this does actually look to be a little warped, so that might be a bit of a problem since the uh, 
the sails itself as well as the gun attached to this. Um, but all in all, it doesn't seem to be like that complicated of a model. If you look at the sails, um, these are very flimsy. Uh, so you're going to want to be very careful with those. And there is a lot of extra flashing uh, here where the arcs are and uh, down here. So this is going to take a little bit of cleaning up to do. Um, here you can see this is actually the point of the weapon itself, um, as well as these are the modifications for the front of the raider to attach the weapon. So this actually looks like this is its own part. Um, so again, it doesn't look like it's going to be too hard to put together. It does have the standard uh, flyer, or not flyer, but skimmer base uh, that comes along with this for the Dark Eldar. Um, so it does have the ball joint uh, pegs. So, but with this being a regular freighter, that shouldn't be much of an issue. I'll put everything back in my bag here. <clears throat> and this is something also that you might want to take a look at. These are the instructions the Forge Lord gives you. Um, so essentially, this is just a page telling you what all the special bits are. These are your conversion pieces. Um, but then as far as actually building the model itself, it looks like they essentially just tell you it's not as broken down as GW's uh, models are. Um, there's a lot of cut and paste, it looks like. But here you can see where the uh, variation is uh, on this model. So. Again, you can kind of take a look at things and see that it essentially anything that's in black is a standard model part, but then the grayer bits, those are going to be your conversion parts. Um, so this thing has a little extra uh, bigger blades here. The whole front is different. You got a different uh, kind of crew compartment or cap here, as well as the barrel of the gun or powerhouse of the gun there. So shouldn't be too complicated to follow, at least with this one, um, but some of the other models um, come with even fewer instructions. Uh, we'll take a look at the Reaper rules here, getting back on here. So if you look at the table of contents here for the index for the Xenos Imperial Armor, um, they have it broken down by race. Um, each one, all the Xenos races as set before are included in this book. Um, so until they start rolling out the full-fledged Imperial Armor books, this at this time will cover you for all of 8th edition for every Xenos army. So if you already have some models, uh, these indexes are pretty cheap. Even with shipping, I think it was only $25, bucks, uh, $25 to get this shipped over. Um, so to have all of the rules for all the Imperial Armor Xenos things and one little index for $25, bucks, that's not a bad deal at all. Um, so let's find uh, the Dark Eldar. They only have two Forge World models. Uh, so we are going to get to see both of those. Um, so again, that was the Reaper that we just took a look at. It's here up at the top. Um, it's built on the same Raider chassis, so it's going to have this speed. It's not going to be quite as durable as most other Forge World models, because again, Dark Eldar stuff just isn't all that durable to begin with. Um, but this thing does hit hard for what it does. Um, these are, this is a heavy choice. Um, it comes with 12 wounds. So again, a little on the light side for something from Forge World, but again, Dark Eldar. Um, starts losing some effectiveness after it loses eight wounds. So eight to 12 wounds. It has a movement of 14, which is very fast. Um, ballistic skill of three plus, and five attacks in close combat. Um, this thing has some pretty nasty close combat weapons on it as well. Um, so it can do quite a bit of damage in any point in the conflict. Um, four to seven wounds. Movement drops down to uh, ten inches. The ballistics goes down to four plus and three attacks in close combat. And then when it drops down to one to three wounds, we're talking a movement of six inches, uh, five plus ballistic skill, and a d3 of attacks. So the weapon skill of this is always a 4+. plus. Uh, strength and toughness are both 6. Again, 12 wounds, leadership of 7 with a save of 4+. plus. 
uh, which 4 plus doesn't sound like a whole lot for a vehicle, but when you play Dark Eldar, 4 plus is one of the tougher things you have. Um, the Reaper is armed with a Storm Vortex projector, scythe veins, and a sharpened prow blade. Um, these can't be taken in squadrons, so each one of these is going to be taking up one slot for you. Um, the scythe veins, which are going to be what you use most of the time in close combat if you do get into it, are only strength 4, so it actually drops the strength down from the vehicle uh, with an AP minus 1 and 1 damage. Um, the sharpened prow blade, however, you can only make a maximum of one attack with this each turn. Um, any remaining attacks have to be made with the scythe veins. But the sharpened prow blade is the strength of the user, so it goes up to 6. Uh, does has an AP of minus one and does two damage with that hit. So again, this isn't a close combat specializing vehicle, but to have two different weapons and to have something that can do two damage in close combat isn't all that bad. Uh, but the main thing here is the Storm Vortex Projector, which is the big cannon that runs the entire length of the vehicle. Um, it has two weapon modes. It has either Blast or Beam. Uh, the Blast has a 24 inch range does a heavy 2d6 uh, for its type. The strength is 6, no AP on it, and only 1 damage. However, if any models are slain in the target unit, it may not advance in the following turn. So if you're going up against uh, some assault units that you know are going to be one to charge across the board as fast as possible, hit them with this thing and you will slow them down considerably, no advancing for them. And then again we have the beam which increases the range to 36 inches. Uh, the type is a heavy D6, so half the shots. But it does go up in strength to strength 8. AP is minus 4 and does a D6 of damage per hit. And again, it keeps the same if models are slain, they can't advance. So this thing has both an anti-infantry and an anti-vehicle mode of fire. So for Dark Eldar, who need to be uh, really flexible, with what they bring, uh, hitting the right targets, taking out the most dangerous things to them as fast as possible. This uh, one model allows you a lot of flexibility to do that. You can target infantry that are going to be a problem, you can target vehicles that are going to be a problem. Um, it's own somewhat in close combat, at least for a turn. Um, it also has a night shield, so on top of the 4-up uh, armor save, it's going to have a 5-plus and vulnerable against ranged weapons only. I'm gonna, does have a chance to explode, uh, but it also does keep the hovering uh, rule. So distance and ranges are always measured to and from the model's hull, even though it has a base. So for nine power points and a heavy slot, that's really not bad for Dark Elder. You really can add a lot to them, especially when you consider that most of their other options are either paint engines, uh, the Kronos engines, uh, you've got couple other things, but really there's not a whole standout model for that. <clears throat> the last thing we're going to get here actually comes in its own box. Is uh, posted the question, what's in the box? Well, the answer is, this is the Dark Eldar Tantalus. Yeah, Jake. Yeah. It's not the Praetorian, Jake. Yeah, Praetorian comes in a small bag. This gets its own box. So... Obviously, this is much different packaging than everything else. Um, I'm going to cut the plastic off of this because it is sealed. So I haven't taken a look at this thing yet. Let's see what we got in here. <clears throat> All right, so Ooh. right off the bat, you get modified version of, I believe this is the front, the yeah, front or side of uh, the vehicle itself. So what the Tantalus is, is it's a twin hull vehicle. So you have a hull uh, on both sides connected there in the back. And I'm actually pretty excited to see the base of this. I believe this is it. Here we go. <clears throat> this is the base of the twin hulls here. Hmm. So looking at the bottom here, um, it does have a very shallow um, ball joint uh, here 
it uses, or they only supply the standard Dark Eldar ball joint base for this. And taking a look at even just this size and where the hole is placed, probably going to have to make a custom base for this thing. Um, Not balanced uh, the best there. I, yeah, that's crazy. What are they thinking? Yeah, wow. So we've got uh, two. Uh, there's actually two guns that go in here. I mean, it looks sweet, but like. It does look sweet, but still. This thing is going to be a monster to transport. No uh, kidding. Good luck with that. Uh, I don't know if does um, – who am I thinking of who makes the really good cases? Mission something or uh, Battle Foam? Battle, Battle Foam. Foam. Maybe they make a case for that? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm actually probably going to have to look because this looks a little insane to try to transport, especially once we get to the, uh, the veins on it. They're ridiculous. Um, but, again, we got a really, really hefty injection point here. Um, got four smaller and one core um, mold pour. So this is going to be a pain just to even get it off of this screw. Um, yeah, um, man. Good luck, dude. <clears throat> want to borrow one of my saws? Uh, we, we have saws. Okay. So, um, uh, here we go. This is what I was talking about. This is the other thing that they bubble wrap. These are the veins, uh, the vein for the ship. And, oh, this is going to need a lot of cleaning. <laughs> so, this here is a uh, vein for the ship. This is actually supposed to be hollow. So, that's going to be um, fun to clean up. <laughs> Got a lot of extra flashing around the uh, little bits here. Everything around here. We've got a little dangling bit here on the end. Um, so, this is definitely going to take a lot of cleanup work. And again, this is very thin. Um, actually, <laughs> holding it up to the light, it's very, very You got some see-through? Yeah, it's very see-through around the uh, supports wow. here. Interesting. So that might be an issue later, especially transporting. I might only be able to use this model in my house. Uh, I don't want to deal with <laughs> transporting it. Um, they also give you... Um, one of the screws here for one of the regular raiders, and you can see the size difference. These are the veins, the blade veins here, or not blade veins, but uh, sails essentially for the raider compared to the tantalus. So we're talking hmm. what, four or five times the size. Yeah. So this is a very, very big, very big ship. Um, one of the awesome things about this model, though. Oh, is it comes with brass etchings. Brass etchings for all of the foot plates. Wow! And it actually, especially done here, right on the bottom, dark elder tantalus floor plates. It comes with it. That's dope. Yeah, it comes that's with cool. It. All right, I'm jealous now. Um, so, <clears throat> so we got both of these here. Took a look at the sail, we took a look at the body. Now let's look at some of the other bits. And this is where some people have a lot of issues putting this thing together. This is actually the piece that goes over top to connect the two hulls. Um, so you can see the two lines here, right up here. Uh, this thing fits on right on top, and that's supposed to be what holds it all together. Um, this is actually a really solid piece though, so I'm really not concerned about, you know, the two sides going in different directions or anything like that. Um, I, it looks like it's just going to be kind of a bear to put together. Um, a lot of the other pieces in here, especially anything with the blades on it or any kind of curvature, um, Dark Eldar, like their notches out of things. Um, it's a lot of cleanup work and a random bit of something here. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of work that gets put into this model. And the question that arises is, is it worth it? And in eighth edition, I honestly believe that this is going to be incredibly worth it. You heard it here first from the Archon. From the Archon. I, <laughs> I am- Save your wallets. <laughs> 
Yeah, this thing it's it's actually not What's the retail what actually what what's the retail on it? What's the retail on this one? I wanna say retail on this one, it's around it's around like ninety two pounds, something like that. So, so okay. That yeah, that's not that's actually not terrible. Yeah. Not I mean, terrible. That's the good thing. Like the Dark Elder, they only have the two different Forge World models, but compared to everything else, they're relatively cheap. Yeah. Um, the Reaper. You're talking two hundred thirty-seven dollars retail for a Serastis Knight. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, and the uh, the Reaper that we looked at earlier, that's only forty-two pounds, I believe. So hmm. I mean, it's pretty cheap uh, in comparison. But uh, the Tantalus itself, it does take a heavy choice. Um, 18 power points if you use those. I'm not going to look up the actual points in the model um, because these indexes are as poorly laid out as the GW ones. All the points are in the back, uh, not with the actual slates. So I'm not going to worry about that for now. Um, it does have 18 wounds, a strength and toughness of 7. So it is one of the beefier, actually, it might be one of the beefiest things the Dark Eldar have. And 18 wounds. Um, so again, pretty hefty. Uh, movement while it's at full health, um, actually up to half health. So 9 to 18 wounds, it has a movement of 16, which is pretty impressive for something that big. Uh, ballistic skill of 3 plus and 6 attacks. Um, then it drops down whenever it's 4 to 8 wounds, it only loses 2 inches of movement, it's still 14. Um, ballistics drops down to 4 plus and attacks go down to 4 as well. Then when it's almost destroyed, one to three remaining wounds, it still has a movement of 12 inches. So this thing is going to be zipping all over the battlefield regardless of how wounded it is. Um, and its ballistic skill doesn't drop either. It's still a four plus when it's at the one to three wound mark. Um, the attacks do drop to D3, however. Um, and it has a three up armor save. It's a single model equipped with two pulse disintegrators and a dire scythe blade. Um, so it has its own special thing on the bottom. The pulse disintegrators are also, I'm pretty sure, unique to it. Uh, so let's take a look at those. The pulse disintegrator is a 36-inch range weapon, assault 6, not D6, but straight up 6, uh, with a strength of 8, an AP of minus 3, and a... Six, uh, so six, shot, 6 times 2, so that's yeah, pretty much 12 plus. damage, hitting on... Hitting on three plus, or even when it's more than okay. half damage, four plus. Okay, so not terrible. I mean, that you're. I would say you're almost most of the time guaranteed to get the damage right. with that vehicle. Yeah. And then uh, the dire scythe blade itself um, is also strength eight with a minus two AP with one damage. Um, so it actually is pretty for a vehicle. It's well versed in close combat as well. Um, but here's the. And the special rules are really what make it shine. Uh, this actually is a transport, and it can transport up to 16 infantry models, uh, with Grotesque taking up the space of two models. Um, it does have the night, sh- uh, night shield, so against ranged attacks, it'll have a 5 up end bomb, um, along with its 3 plus armor save. It does have a chance to explode on a 6. Um, if it does explode, when it's reduced to 0 wounds, each unit within 9 inches suffers D6 mortal wounds. So when it blows up, it blows up big. Um, it does have the hovering rule. Uh, it has the enhanced aether sails. So if it advances, it just doubles its current movement. No rolls. It just doubles whatever movement it still has based on its wounds. Um, it does have a special rule scything charge. Um, if this model finishes a charge move within one inch of one or more enemy units, Roll a d6 for each of these units, and on a 4+, plus, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. So this vehicle is actually kind of meant to charge into things. Not necessarily as a last resort, but it can do some damage, especially if you have a group of enemies close together. Because um, if it finishes within one inch of one or, more, one or more enemy units, so if you got a clump of guys, you can actually do some serious damage across multiple units. Um, it is open-topped. So any model that's inside still gets to fire out. Um, and with its 16 model transport capacity, you can put a lot of warriors in there. You could put uh, some trueborn in there with a bunch of special weapons. You can really load this thing up. <clears throat> but I think the most impressive rule, the reason that I got this, is it has a special rule called the Chariot of Tortured Souls, which sounds very Dark Eldari. 
Um, if your warlord is embarked in the Tantalus, all friendly units within line of sight use the warlord's leadership characteristic instead of their own. Um, this ability does not apply to units that are entirely on or within cover, even if they can draw a line of sight. So with them, as important as leadership is in this edition, um, you know, extra guys can flee units if you have those uh, a bad roll on your tests. Um, being able to use somebody of, I think um, Archons have a leadership of nine. So even if your warrior squad loses its sergeant, it's at seven base, or I believe it's a seven base leadership for them. You know, if, as long as they can see the Tantalus and your warlord is on it, they get to use his leadership. So you're getting a leadership boost essentially across the entire table, um, as long as this thing is still alive. So I think for Dark Eldar, with as squishy as they are, because when they get hit, they die. Um, so being able to do anything that boosts their survivability of those uh, impending leadership roles uh, to see if guys flee is quite a big boon to them. All right. Uh, give us the closing thoughts, and uh, I would say tell them you're going to do a, a build video, at least a build video for this stuff, and if you want, tell them you're going to do a paint video. I mean, I, of course, want that, <laughs> but I don't know if you want that. So. All right, we'll, we'll see. All right. All right, so this has been unboxing with the Archon, um, taking a look at these things, some closing thoughts. The models uh, themselves as, as a whole seem to be pretty well put together. Um, you got to keep in mind that, you know, living in the U.S. here, these things get shipped across the ocean. Uh, so there's going to be a little bit of damage, wear and tear, those kind of things. But the box itself was pretty solid when it arrived. Um, a lot of these things are still on the injection points for the molds. Um, so overall, I would say, given what it had to go through to get here, a lot of the stuff is in pretty good shape. Um, the really thick injections on some of these things are going to be a bit harder to deal with, but a good saw and a file and some patience and you can take care of it just fine. Um, as far as the rules go, um, a lot of the stuff that I got, I'm pretty happy with. Um, it's everything has a purpose. Um, and it's just kind of a, how you want to play your game. I'm not going to use all these models every time I play with those units, but it's, it's against Jake. <laughs> yes, Jake. Yeah. That missile launcher is going to get a lot of use. Um, <laughs> but, um, these kind of things, you know, a lot of them are situational. I'm sure you can spam them, but that gets really pricey on your real life wallet here. Uh, not, and also in game, some of these things are pretty expensive uh, points of power level wise. So you're not going to really be able to spam these things uh, too much. Um, but if you really need that, uh, you know, if your army is missing that niche little bit, like my guard army doesn't really have a whole lot of anti-air. I don't have hydras. I don't bring those kind of things. Um, so that missile launcher with its uh, missile or anti-air missiles as well as anti-titan missiles which is again something my guard doesn't have a whole lot of uh, it really fills uh, some gaps in my army um, so overall i would say these things were uh, worth it it was kind of an expensive purchase but you know this hobby isn't cheap to begin with and we all knew that going in um, <laughs> so um honestly i I'm really excited about getting these things built um, and painted, and I will um, do some building videos uh, to kind of show how some of these things go together. Because, like I said before, and shown like some of the instructions really aren't the greatest, um, and some of these rare models um, you can look on YouTube and you might not find um, instructional videos of how to put these things together. So I'll, I'll put some build videos together and uh, maybe some painting videos as well um, to go along with these. And overall, I'm really happy with uh, everything that came in. So can't wait to show you guys the uh, building videos. And this is Archon Hoop signing out. See you next time.